Awesome. Well, it's such a privilege to be able to bring the word this morning. Um, My assignment this morning is to stir faith in you, to cause you to see bigger and to jump further and just believe God at his word. So I really want to stir faith this morning. And to get us started, I want to share a story of before Sam and I were dating. Uh, He was my life group leader, all right? So just a tip for anyone, you know, you're single, join a life group or start a life group. It's worked for too many people that I can count. Um, But he was my life group leader, and um, I didn't realize that he was starting to take an interest in me, and this one particular uh, event was coming up. It was a Red Frog University retreat to Fraser Island, and Sam was one of the leaders, and he actually paid for me to go. So I went along to this retreat. We were camping at Fraser, and, and I started to kind of clue on that maybe he was interested because he was doing really kind things for me that he wasn't doing for other people. (laughs) Like, you know, I thought, okay, that's kind. You know, my life group leader paid for me to come. That's, you know, that happens. But when he was like making a cup of tea for me every morning, like, yeah, that's different. Um, and, but this one particular day we were at Lake Mackenzie. Give me a wave if you've been to Lake Mackenzie on Fraser Island. It's beautiful, and so we took the trip to Lake Mackenzie, and all us girls were sunbaking by the water, and Sam, being one of the leaders, you know, was busy getting things done, and, and he walked past me so many times. I was like, what is with this guy? One minute he's making me cups of tea, and then the next he's ignoring me. He walked past me several times while we were at Lake Mackenzie, It wasn't until later that day I realized that when he's at the beach or at swimming, he takes his glasses off. (laughs) And he actually wasn't even recognizing me. I was just one of the silhouettes on the beach. And so the whole day I'm like, oh, I ain't got no time for a guy who's going to be up one minute and down the next. And then the next minute I realized he actually couldn't see me. He actually couldn't see me. But do you know, the point I'm making is that it's actually entirely possible to be looking and not seeing. Until we put our glasses on, spiritual glasses, and see clearly what we're meant to be seeing. And so what I want to share this morning is around the idea that we need to live with heaven's perspective. We need to see more than the limitations of maybe our natural vision. Helen Keller who you may know is famous. She was a remarkable woman and was blind. She was blind. And she is known as saying, there's only one thing worse than being blind, and that is having sight but no vision. So a blind person saying about you and I, possibly I see more than you do. There's only one thing sadder than being blind, and that's seeing and having no vision. And so I want to talk today about living with heaven's perspective. And we're going to start in 2 Kings. And the story here is of this prophet named Elisha. Now there's two prophets in the Bible named very similar names, Elisha and Elijah. We're going to start with Elisha. And Elisha and his young servant are surrounded by the enemy. And what's gotten them into this situation is that being a prophet to God's people, Israel meant that God gave Elisha the inside information on what the enemy's plans were. So Elisha was constantly warning Israel's kings of what the Syrian kings were plotting. And so the Syrian king is fed up and he's like, right, we're going to ambush this guy and take him out. Okay, so here we are in 2 Kings chapter 6, if we can read it together. And the Syrian king said, go ahead and see where Elisha is, that I may send and seize him. And it was told to him, he is in Dotham. So the Syrian king sent there horses, chariots, and a great army. They came by night and surrounded the city. When the servant of the man of God, the young guy, Elisha's apprentice, when he rose early and went out, behold, an army filled with horses and chariots was around the city. Elisha's servant said to him, Alas, my master, what shall we do? Elisha answered, Fear not. For those with us 
are more than those with them. Then Elisha prayed, Lord, I pray you open his eyes that he may see. And the Lord opened the young man's eyes and he saw and behold, the mountain was full of horses and chariots of fire around about Elisha. It's a powerful thing. This is literally two in the natural, in the physical, two guys surrounded by an army. And Elisha says, no, 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 you're not seeing the full picture. And he prays, God, open his eyes that he may see. And when his spiritual eyes are open, when he puts on the lens of the spirit, he actually sees the supernatural. And so my first point is, if we're going to live with heaven's perspective, we need to see the supernatural. We need to see the supernatural. You notice here that this young guy, when he saw in the natural, Elisha had to say, fear not. I want to say to you this morning, if you're living in fear, your eyesight is limited. If you're living with fear or any of those things that are binding you up, that are not life-giving, your sight is limited. You're not seeing what God wants you to see. Because the first thing he says is, fear not. And then he prays, Lord, open his eyes. This guy's eyes were open, but not his spiritual eyes. Lord, open his, his eyes so he may see, truly see. And when his spiritual eyes were open, he saw a whole different reality. And so when we see in the spirit, what happens? Well, we just need to look at the posture of Elisha. So because Elisha could see in the spirit, he was confident. He was confident. Elisha had the ability to stand fearlessly, although in the natural he was outnumbered. In the supernatural, he was confident. And so when we see in the supernatural, we're confident. We have this confidence. Why? Because you and I are sons and daughters of the living God. You and I have access to all the resource of heaven. So if we're afraid, we've actually fallen into the lies of the flesh. But when we see with the eyes of the Spirit, we have a confidence, a peace that passes all understanding because it doesn't make sense. Only in the Spirit. And so we need to see with the eyes of the Spirit, which gives us confidence. The other thing seeing with the Spirit does is that it becomes contagious and it inspires others. Can I tell you, let's not worry about how contagious COVID is. Let's actually sh- like spread some other contagions around the place. And I want to tell you, seeing with the eyes of the Spirit becomes something you can impart into others. He prayed over this young man and the authority he had to see in the spirit was literally imparted into another person. It's contagious. It inspires other people. I want to tell you, it is our job to teach the next generation to see in the spirit. We live in a bubble wrap generation where every mum wants to wrap her children in bubble wrap and protect them from doing anything of significance. We actually need to cause our children to rise up, see more than they see in the spirit. We need to hone their spiritual capacity and encourage their spiritual capacity to see bigger, to stretch what they see in the natural. Why could Elisha impart? Why could Elisha live this contagious, inspiring life? Well, it's because someone did it for him. So his mentor, his coach was Elijah. And so if we rewind a few chapters into 1 Kings chapter 18, or actually, yeah, just 1 Kings, we'll read about Elijah. Elijah was a punk. This guy, like if you want to know what it's like to just defy culture and stand up for the things of God, you need to read the account of Elijah. He was, he was King Ahab's worst nightmare. So King Ahab was leading Israel, God's people, and he was leading them away from God. And Elijah was God's mouthpiece, and so he was very much correcting Ahab a lot of the time. Ahab learnt the hard way to listen to Elijah. 
resentfully and reluctantly he learnt that this guy, when he speaks, what he says takes place. And I want to tell you today on a side note that we are today in the days of Elijah and Ahab. We need to stop pining for the days of David. That was your great-grandmother's day when biblical morality was the norm, when worshipping God was the norm in culture. We are currently in the days of Ahab and Elijah where believing the things of God cannot be any more countercultural if we tried. To be a Christian today, I want to just let you know that you are a conservative, religious radical. If you believe the Bible, that's what you are in today's culture. We may as well just resign to it and admit it and be it in our culture. And so here's Elijah. I love saying it because it gets so quiet. So here's Elijah, and he's speaking to Ahab and confronting Ahab on the things that Ahab's doing to lead culture away from God. And so he actually says at God's word there's going to be a drought, and there's a drought, and nothing that this powerful king can do can stop the drought. And so everything happens at Elijah's word, and and you may know the story of then he has a face-off with, so it's him against all the prophets of Baal, 450 prophets of Baal, ones that are perpetuating the atrocities that Ahab is pushing forward into culture. And um, Elijah is victorious against 450 prophets of Baal. And then we're caught up to speed now in 1 Kings 18. Let's read it together. Because, hang on, let me just pause. So before he faces off at Mount Carmel with the 450 prophets of Baal, he hears a word from God saying there's going to be rain. Okay, so he just hears a word. There's going to be rain. And it brings us up to speed here. They've had the face off. God has proven himself spectacularly. Elijah said to Ahab, up on your feet, eat, drink, and celebrate. The rain is on its way. I hear it coming. I want to tell you there was no rain on the way. What he'd heard was a word from God. There was no rain. He'd heard a word. So Ahab did it because he's like, I just got to do what this guy says, right? He got up and ate and drank. Meanwhile, Elijah climbed to the top of Mount Carmel and bowed deeply in prayer with his face between his knees. You know, when I read that recently, I realized while some people feast, other people pray. Then he said to his young servant, he says, Elijah says to his young servant, on your feet now and look towards the sea. He went and looked and reported back, I don't see a thing. Keep looking, said Elijah, seven times if necessary. And sure enough, on the seventh time, he said, oh yes, I see a cloud, but it's very small, no bigger than a man's hand rising up out of the sea. Look at what Elijah does. Quickly then, get on your way. Tell Ahab, saddle up and get down from the mountain before the rain stops you. Things happened fast, the sky grew black with wind-driven clouds, and then a huge cloudburst of rain, with Ahab hightailing it in his chariot for Jezreel. And God strengthened Elijah mightily, putting up his robe and tying it around his waist. Elijah ran in front of Ahab's chariot until they reached Jezreel. My second point is this, take a mile. When God gives you an inch, take a mile. That's faith. Too many of us, want to see the storm clouds before we make an announcement. All he saw was a cloud the size of a man's hand. Actually, he was declaring before he even saw the cloud the size of a man's hand. What he was declaring was based off what he'd heard from God. I want to tell you, a word from God needs to be enough. A word from God needs to be enough if you're going to live with heaven's perspective. Too many of us want the blueprint and the insurance plan and the money back guarantee before we step out and do anything for God. But he said, Ahab, there's rain coming. I can hear it. He couldn't hear it. He could hear the word of God. Ahab, you better get going because there's torrential rain coming. No, there wasn't. 
It was a cloud the size of a man's hand that needs to be enough. God's word needs to be enough for a declaration to come out of your mouth. And the smallest evidence needs to be enough for you to action. We need to live with heaven's perspective. We are with the authority of heaven rather than the authority of the natural. That's what faith is. When God gives you an inch, take a mile. Because Romans 4.17 says, We serve a God who calls those things that are not as though they already are. We need to live with that level of faith. I remember about eight years ago, when I first preached on this concept of the cloud the size of a man's hand, our global senior pastor, Mark Ramsey, had been given a cancer diagnosis. And so we all had to step it up and preach a whole lot more and do the circuit and, and carry a lot more weight as he was going through his journey and as we were lifting up his arms, so to speak. And I remember preaching. I remember sitting in the pews. I remember being around him when he would come in week after week and we were literally watching him deteriorate before our eyes as he went through his treatment where he would sit front and center, hair falling out, losing weight, the burn marks on the radiation sites, and we would watch this mighty man of God just shrivel before our eyes. But he was there every week, without fail, in the front row. I want to tell you, the church grew. Watching that faith stirred us in our patheticness. And the church grew as we watched his resolve. And I remember preaching for the first time on this cloud the size of a man's hand. And Mark later told us a story when his journey with cancer had come to an end and he got the all clear. And for the first time, I never will forget that staff meeting where for 45 minutes he shared about the journey for the first time because for more than 12 months he didn't even say the C word while he was going through it because of the power of words. He would not give power to that evil name. And so when he got the all clear, I remember that meeting, and he's a man of few words, but in that meeting he shared the journey and we all, with tears streaming down our faces, listened to the struggles. And and he said that, you know, he got to a point where his throat was so burnt out he couldn't speak. The... um, chemo and the radiation just messed with his mind, so even when he wanted to relax and watch the funny TV series that once made him laugh, they were no longer making him laugh, he was just numb and very, very unwell. And he's telling the story of the journey, and then he said, but there were times when Lee would come into the bedroom and I was lying there, I felt so sick and so unwell, and she said, how are you? And I couldn't speak, and I would just do this. Just hold up my fist. I see a cloud the size of a man's hand. And that's all I need. He would just hold his fist up in defiance, in testimony, in faith. Not giving power to the situation, but pressing into the Word of God. That's the level of faith you and I need to have. When we're going through it, can you just do this? I see a cloud the size of a a man's hand. And Ahab, you better get going because the rain's coming. You better get going because the rain's coming. We need to be a people that the enemy regretfully messes with. We need to be a people that can rise up and go, you know what? You're going to regret even trying that. I've done that so many times. When I feel overwhelmed at the opposition, and I literally will say out loud in the atmosphere of my home, there is going to be a day you're going to regret this very moment because I see a cloud the size of a man's hand, and there's torrential rain coming 
you'd better get going. This is the sort of people we need to be. When God gives you an inch, take a mile. My last point, this is the make or break. This last point will determine whether you see the rain or not. We have to remain steadfast. We have to remain steadfast. Church, you can hear a word from God, you can see something, but you have to stand on it resolutely, not shaken, not intimidated. Many people um, come and, and ask us to pray for them, to stand in agreement with them, and I count that as the greatest privilege. Such a privilege that anyone would come and share their struggle and ask for us to stand. And what I have started saying just this year is, yes, I'll pray for your healing I'll pray for your breakthrough, but more than that, I'm praying that you hear something or you see something. Because if you see something in God, it doesn't matter what anyone else says. When you hear something in God, it doesn't matter what anyone else says. The doctor can say something, but you've seen a cloud the size of a man's hand. And so I'll say that to you. My prayer is actually that you see something that you hear something because then you have something to stand on. Then you have something to throw in the air. Then you have something to look to and cling to. We need to stand. We don't just pray. We pray until. We don't just pray once or twice. We pray until. We stand until. Matthew 24, 13 says, He who endures till the end will be saved. Philippians 6, it says, put on all the armor, do everything you can, because in the evil day, once you've done everything, just stand. Stand. Romans 12, 12, we rejoice in hope. We are patient in tribulation, and we continue steadfastly in prayer. Jesus taught about it himself. The apostles taught about it. There's actually a reward on the other side of our standing firm. The reward is on the other side. There's a reward waiting for those of us who don't back down. We must remain firm, remain steadfast. Do you know we're called to see? You and I are called to see, to envisage, to create. But in the day in and day out of life, we can become discouraged, We can become distracted. We can become intimidated. We can become worn down. We have to remain steadfast. Do you know it's easy to be awesome on day one? Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. I know what my confession needs to be. Day one, day two, still easy. Day three, year four, year six. When the enemy is relentlessly trying to intimidate and wear us down, we need to remain steadfast. We need to rise up in those moments when it keeps coming, when we're being sifted and we just need to go, no. I see a cloud the size of a man's hand. We need to remain steadfast. I want to encourage you this morning to allow your spirit to see something again, to believe something again, bigger than what you see in the natural. 